Hey everybody, welcome to Tech for Psych, where we combine the latest in neurotechnology with ancient wisdom to supercharge your brain. I'm your medical doctor confident, Dr. Cody Rawl. I had a great talk with Dr. Jeff Tarrant, who is a psychologist, who is a veteran of the neurofeedback field and has been using this technology for over 20 years. Dr. Tarrant founded the Neuromeditation Institute and wrote a great book called Meditation Interventions to Rewire the Brain. In this talk, we covered the surging interest in neurofeedback meditation using EEG and other technologies, different types of meditations to use, specific brain waves that he's targeted over decades of neurofeedback training and practice, mobile EEG technology like the Muse and its benefits, and his work with a virtual reality EEG interface Helium app through a company called StoryUp. Hey, it's Dr. Cody Rall with Tech for Psych. I'm here with Dr. Jeff Tarrant, the founder of the Neuromeditation Institute. Dr. Jeff, how are you doing? Hey, good. I appreciate you having me on. Well, I'm so excited to have you on because, uh, you know, I had uh, been looking more and more into content about EEG neurofeedback and how that can be used for meditative techniques and found your book online and Amazon and read it and really, really enjoyed it. So I'm very happy that you could be on the program to talk about anything from EEG to meditation to neurofeedback. It's all kind of being synergistic these days. And, uh, you know, you've, you've done decades of work in this area. So I'm really excited to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks. Well, uh, yeah, I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> and so could you tell us a little bit about the Neuromeditation Institute? How did it get started and what you guys are up to right now? Um, yeah, the, sh the short version is, um, you know, I, I mean, I've been in the neurofeedback world for about 20 years, um, which is about how long I've been seriously meditating. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those things were basically parallel paths for a long time. They weren't really intersecting for me. I had my meditation practice and I went to work and did neurofeedback. Um, and, you know, obviously it, it's not a big stretch to figure out that at some point down the road, you can start putting those two things together. Mm -hmm. Um, but honestly, you know, that was a while back and, you know, everybody who'd been doing that work, it was basically increase alpha in the back of the head mm -hmm. was kind of the, that was it. That was kind of the only thing to do. And I did that for a while and it was not particularly satisfying for me, um, which we can talk about later why that might be. Um, and I kind of, dro I dropped it really. I just kind of said, yeah, okay, whatever. I'll just keep doing these parallel things. And then about five years ago, Tom Kalora uh, from Brain Master uh, was working on a book and asked me if I would be interested in writing a chapter. And I said, of course, right? I mean, you're not going to say no. Somebody asks you to write a, cha a book chapter. Um, and of course, my next question was, well, what do you want me to write about? Because I don't consider myself an expert in any particular area of neurofeedback. And he said, whatever you want to write about. Mm -hmm. And literally, it just came out of my mouth. It must have been divine inspiration or something. I have no idea. And I said, how about neuromeditation? And he said, great. And it was like, oh, all right. Uh, <laughs> you know. So at that point, I, I kind of, I really had to figure out what I was going to say. Um, mm. and, and so that really forced me to really dive into the research literature in a way that I hadn't before. And figure out how to make sense out of all of this information and try to simplify it. Um, and so that's really how this all got started. It started with this book chapter and then literally it's just kind of exploded exponentially over the last four years. And, um, you know, I'm sort of shocked, you know, moment by moment at, at how fast this is moving. Um, I joke sometimes that I have a lot of good ideas, but, uh, no, I have a lot of ideas. Most of them aren't good. Uh, but this one, you know, somehow seemed to land at the right time, the right place or something. I don't know. Um, and so you asked about what we're up to now. And, um, you know, we're really moving in this direction of doing more trainings and workshops um, as opposed to just kind of like seeing folks in my office, uh, you know, still doing that, but really trying to expand this information and make it more accessible to a larger population. So, you know, really working on more... Um, uh, you know, three day workshops, more intensives. And then, um, you and I were just talking before that we just launched, um, kind of an online distance education, some, uh, some content, you know, some classes that people can take online. So that's for us, that's pretty exciting. And that's, that's where we're at at the moment. Yeah. And you mentioned that, um, you know, you guys are holding workshops and in reading your book, you had specific meditations for specific people and, 
Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of clarify that in your workshops, right, you're using neurofeedback to enhance people's meditation. Is that a pretty good sum summary? I'm sure you're doing a, lo a lot more than that, but that is that like kind of the core of what the workshops are about? Yeah, actually, we have two different kinds of workshops right now, and um, one of them is exactly what you're saying. It's combining neurofeedback with meditation, and so kind of teaching the, the science and the practice of that. Mm -hmm. um, so the morning is more content, and then the afternoon is like practicum. We're hooking each other up, and we're, we're running through the protocols, and yeah, we, we pretty much work with four or five different styles of meditation uh, for those workshops. The other workshops are actually designed for people who are not interested in neurofeedback. So mm -hmm. it's the same concepts, the same information in terms of what's happening in the brain and how that connects to mental health. Um, but then it's exploring all of the other strategies beyond neurofeedback uh, to kind of work with this. Because, you know, we realize that not everybody is going to have the equipment or want to mess with the equipment. Yeah, and I'd love to dive into more uh, specifics about uh you know, the categories of meditation that you work with people on. Uh, but, but first, I wanted to sort of revisit this concept that you talked about earlier was, you know, you've been doing this work for some time. And there's been this sort of surge in interest as of late in the last couple of years. And I wanted to get your perspective of what the heck is going on? Why are people so, you know, interested in EEG and meditation now? What's going on? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, good question. Uh, it's really wild to see. I mean, obviously, you know, you've been like really tracking this closely. Um, and it's it's weird how much it's advancing. And, and you know, I think partially it's just an issue of tech development. You know, the, the, the fact that we have more accessible tech, uh, it's, it's much more user friendly. Um, you know, I mean, we still bump into that with more of the sophisticated neurofeedback stuff. It's not particularly user friendly. It's, it's, you know, it's expensive, the interface is, clean, and, you know, that's not going to be attractive to your average consumer. So, you know, the fact that we have muses and emotives and things like that out there now make it much more um, uh, possible for people to kind of use this. I think that's one aspect. I think the other aspect is the, the just explosion of research on what's going on in the brain with meditation and, you know, uh, different states of consciousness. That, you know, um, it, it's kind of the, it's like the timing is perfect of where the tech is developing at the same time that the research is developing, you know, and you've got everybody into sort of brain hacking and consciousness hacking. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it's just like the perfect sort of storm. Maybe that's not the right analogy, but everything's coming together at the exact same time, you know, to kind of like feed into this. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. It's uh, sort of more multifactorial, like exposure to the equipment, exposure to the benefits of meditation and then also, yeah, now that uh, biohacking, neurohacking is a thing, everybody, you know, wants to get into it. Um, and so do you, you think that this is sort of linked on to uh, an overall more interest in mindfulness and meditation in the West? Because I know that we've seen, definitely seen that in the last decade, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, it's, you know, looking at kind of like how the whole, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction you know, I, I, I usually kind of go back to that, you know, when kind of John Kabat-Zinn got that started in the late seventies and, you know, really kind of making a more, uh, approachable way to teach and talk about meditation in the West, you know, and, you know, I feel like, you know, and maybe not specifically that program, but that kind of idea, right. That it's like, wait a minute, we can talk about this and we can teach this in a way that's accessible. That's, it's a short term model. Uh, you don't have to use a bunch of esoteric language. Uh, you don't have to be Buddhist. You know, uh, it, it, it's broadened it up to everybody, you know, to the point that now, you know, um, it's almost surprising if you don't see meditation in schools and in hospitals and, in, you know, uh, places of business, you know, which 10 years ago, that would be unthinkable. And so, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's amazing, you know, and, and I came from the Midwest. Well, you're in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Um uh, although you're in a little bit more progressive area than I was, uh, and, you know, sort of watching how just the culture has changed and their ideas about meditation have changed, you know, that it's not this scary thing, uh, you know, and we, all the time we talk about it as mental training. It's like, it's mental training. Um, you know, if you kind of boil it down, uh, that's the way we talk about it and think about it. And it's like, well, who doesn't want mental training? You know, it's like, you don't right. have to believe anything. You can believe nothing. 
and benefit from mental training. Um, you know, one of the things that I've seen from the clinical side is they really try to boil it down to be incredibly simple for people to engage in. So I see a lot of mindfulness training, just kind of being aware of surroundings, aware of feelings within you, and it helps for mental health uh, treatment, that type of thing. But um, one of the things that's really imp- apparent in looking at your book and other people's materials is that, you know, there's all different types of meditation. And I thought you very, really, very nicely broke it down into four or five different groups. Would you mind going through uh, those different categories and talking them about them a little bit just to give us uh, a feel for how those different types of meditation can be different types of training and used in different uh, areas of your life. Totally. Um, Yeah. And, you know, and I should say that, you know, the way we came up with these cat, this categorization, this, Mm -hmm. you know, a system, um, it it wasn't like I I made this up and it wasn't like I did all this research. You know, the Mm -hmm. the research has been done Mm -hmm. by, you know, people who have been doing this for a long time at big universities. And so, Really, what I did was kind of capitalize on that and, and and look at all this and go like, wow, you guys did all this work. This is great. How can we kind of take this information and, and synthesize it? And so um, the four main styles of meditation we talk about are focus, mindfulness, open heart, and quiet mind. And we chose those terms because we wanted it, again, to be kind of accessible and user-friendly. Um, and so we wanted to pick names that made sense to people and, you know, and all of those, for the most part, you don't have to know much, but you hear that name and you get a sense of what it's about. Um, and so we felt like that was important, um, you know, to, to make it accessible. Um, but when you kind of look at some of those styles, so focus, that's an obvious one, Mm -hmm. but you know, in the research literature, you know, it might be called concentration practice. Mm -hmm. It might be called a mantra practice. It might be called focused attention is what a lot of the researchers like to call it. But it's basically the same thing, you know. It's it's the basic uh, practice of picking a single target for your attention, holding your attention there. Your mind wanders off. You mm-hmm. notice the mind wanders off, and you gently and patiently and lovingly escort it back. Uh, you know. And so, what we know from the research is that to some degree, it doesn't really matter what your focus is, what what the target is. If it's your breath, if it's a mantra, if it's an image of the Buddha, um, if you're, if the objective is to hold your attention on a single target, most of the brain functions are the same. And so we can simplify all of that. It's like, well, we don't need to know all of this extra stuff, really. You know, we can, we can just kind of boil it down. Um, now, mindfulness is probably the trickiest one because, uh, you know, it's not very clearly defined at this mm-hmm. point. It's it's a mess. Uh, you know, and other researchers have addressed this, that it's like, you know, even the scales that measure mindfulness don't all kind of correlate with each other very well. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like, well, what are we talking about with mindfulness? And so the way that we're talking about it is really kind of what you were describing earlier, this idea of, uh, shifting into an observer role, sort of, um, uh, you know, watching what's happening moment to moment, observing your thoughts and your feelings and your bodily sensations without getting attached to them. So without grasping for things or pushing things away, sort of allowing things to be as they are. So being in the present moment and just accepting. And, you know, even just that definition, you know, you can hear that that's different than focus. That's not the same thing. You're using your attention in a very different way. And so for me, it's it's like, and I think most people, when you think about it, it's like, well, obviously your brain is not going to do the exact same thing. If you're using your attention differently, mm-hmm. your brain's going to behave differently. And it's like, well, right, you know, of course. Um, and so, you know, again, same thing. There's a lot of ways to do that practice, um, but more or less, your brain kind of does the same thing. Now we're finally getting clarification on that because that was a messy one too. Like there was a bunch of research coming out in mindfulness showing all kinds of different things. And um, that's been the biggest struggle. I, I think I finally have some understanding of what the heck's going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, open heart is really the loving kindness, compassion type practices. Um, but we wanted to be broader than that. We didn't want to just limit ourselves to loving kindness and compassion, which is why we use the term open heart to include things like mm-hmm. gratitude practices or mm-hmm. forgiveness or things like that. And so for us, kind of the broader umbrella uh, sort of incorporates any kind of practice where you're intentionally activating a positive emotional state and sustaining it. 
usually you're then doing something with it, sending that out to others or giving it to yourself or, mm -hmm. or using it for healing or whatever. Um, and again, there's a lot of ways to do it, but there's some common things that happen in the brain. And then quiet mind is the last one, which is, you know, that's the stereotype of meditation that, you know, somehow magically your brain is completely empty and there's nothing going on, uh, you know. And so, you know, clearly that is a state that um, is desirable mm -hmm. and, and a lot of meditation traditions talk about. Um, and so, you know, obviously it's going to be an important one for us to look at. Um, and so it's, it's, it's actually very common from a brainwave perspective that the, the, the brainwave patterns are, are almost identical between like transcendental meditation and most of the Zen practices um, kind of fit into that category. Um, and so, you know, kind of what we have done is kind of like, you know, look at these categories, but then also my background as a psychologist, look to see, well, how could each of these have potentially different impacts for mental health and wellness. What would you say is the most powerful part of incorporating neural feedback into that? What does that do for the person that's trying to learn meditation? Yeah, you know, um, you know, and I've been doing this for a while with um, individual clients and, um, you know, and teaching it in groups. And one of the things that, that I've really noticed is that regardless of what protocol we're using, regardless of kind of which direction we're going, one of the things that I think is beneficial across the board is just increasing self-awareness, mm -hmm. you know, um, because, you know, it, and that's what meditation does anyway, right? I mean, meditation increases self-awareness for sure. Um, but with the, the inclusion of neurofeedback, you're getting levels of awareness of your internal state that you, you just cannot get in any other way. And, you know, it makes you aware of the subtleties of your mind in a way that I'm not, I don't know of anything else that can do it. Um, and the more you practice it, it's like, you just keep stripping away those layers, you know, and you think you kind of know where you're at and then you keep practicing. It's like, Oh my gosh, there's another weird little crinkle in my consciousness that I didn't even know was there. Um, and so for me, I think that's the magic of it is, um, you know, kind of finding all of these little tiny variations of your consciousness and learning how to navigate it. Yeah, I've seen some of your previous presentations and just some of these brain maps that you've put up and just beautiful Loretta 3D mapping of people's brains with the, you know, multiple EEG leads. And I've really appreciated sort of the, um, uh, you know, small resolution that you've gotten down to. It's like the more leads that you use, the, 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 the more powerful the software you use, the more you can really see and narrow down these signals to specific brain areas. And you mentioned before that this has really evolved from just trying to increase alpha power to where we're at now, where there's a bunch of variability between different meditations. And I was hoping that you could just give us a taste of these different brainwave patterns that you see in different meditative techniques and how that's evolved over time. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, with, with focus, I mean, focus is, is the easiest one for people to usually understand because it's, it's not the easiest one to do, but it's mm -hmm. the easiest one for people to kind of like wrap their brains around. It's, you know, um, and you know, what I found is that really there's kind of two areas of the brain that you need to monitor to really get really, really clean data for that. And the first is, you know, monitoring something in the frontal lobes. There's a mm -hmm. few different areas that we could look at, but essentially looking, are you focused? Are you paying attention? You know, are, are you sustaining your attention? But really all we can monitor there is, are you, are you alert and paying attention to something? Like we don't really know what you're paying attention to. So somebody could be obsessing and it's going to look active. Uh, just the same right. as if somebody is focusing on their breath. Um, and so that information by itself isn't enough. Um, I learned that the hard way. Mm. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so then, so usually we, we look at gamma activity up here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I like looking at gamma more than some of the other brain waves. It seems to work better. Um, and then we also need to look at the back of the head, uh, you know, particularly somewhere around the posterior cingulate, you know, as, as close as, if we're using S Loretta, we can get down to the posterior cingulate. 
if we're on the surface, you know, PZ, kind of where the, the, the head kind of rounds back. Um, and, you know, looking at deactivation of that area, because mm -hmm. that's the hub of the default mode network. And when it's active, um, almost 100% of the time, you're going to be thinking about yourself or mm -hmm. thinking about something in relation to yourself. And so we don't want that active. So if you monitor those two things, you can tell, are you focused? And are you focused on yourself? Or are you focused on something else? And so by combining those two, you can get a pretty good idea of where the person's at. Um, and so, you know, that combo is really important. Um, and you can measure activity in the, um, our deactivation of the posterior cingulate a couple of ways. And this is another thing we've kind of figured out is that individual differences are important to consider. Um, for some people, we can look at alpha one back there and trying to raise alpha one because alpha one is associated with more of a quiet internal state. Um, but for some people that doesn't work so well and we have to actually look at decreasing beta or mm -hmm. decreasing high beta and that actually works better. It's kind of the same thing. It's like opposite sides of the same coin. But having the flexibility to make that kind of call based on the individual is super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, so that's, you know, that, that's one pattern. Mindfulness um, is very different. We can actually look at the exact same brain regions up here in the front and back here, but we're looking at totally different things. So in the front, we actually want an increase of theta. It's actually a special kind of theta called frontal midline theta. And, um, and so that's a softer brain wave. You know, it's a softer kind of attention, which mindfulness is. Mindfulness is a softer attention. Um, and then back here, actually, we usually want a decrease of gamma. Mm. Um, so it's also kind of a quieting, but it's got a little bit of a different flavor to it. And so when you kind of add those two things together, again, it's like, you know, you are paying attention, but you're paying attention to this really soft, gentle, easy, relaxed kind of way. Um, you know, for the loving kindness, we're almost always looking at gamma. Uh, and Richie Davidson's work with the Tibetan monks, you know, the work he's done at the University of Wisconsin, Usually we're looking also at the anterior cingulate. You're still focused, but then we usually want the right insula involved. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the right insula, obviously it's part of the salience network, but it's also um, involved in emotions and empathy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and the right side seems to be much more important in terms of feeling those emotions in the body as opposed to just thinking about a feeling, which usually tends to show up on the left. It's really interesting when you're looking at somebody's brain live with the S Loretta and you can see, you know, if the, if the left side's all lit up and I stop them, I go, what's going on? And they'll tell you, it's like, Oh, I was thinking like they're trying to feel, mm -hmm. you know, but they're not there. You know, whereas people who are like, Oh, I was thinking about holding my puppy and petting it, you know, and the right side's all lit up. Uh, so it's cool when you can kind of see that in a live version like that. Quiet mind is all about alpha one. That's the alpha. There's that alpha pattern that was, you know, so prevalent before. But, you know, what we've found is that it's not the whole band of alpha. The whole band of alpha is too big and the mind can still have a lot going on if you include the whole thing. If you just look at alpha one, eight to ten hertz, um, and you got a ton of that going on, the mind is pretty quiet. Um, so, you know, you can do that just at the default mode network but you know, you can also start including other areas. I like including some of the left hemisphere stuff with mm -hmm. that. Um, and so that, you know, you're kind of getting a language, uh, you know, mental stuff, you know, you shut all that down, shut the default mode network down and boy, there's, it's pretty, you can get pretty silent there. You know, it's amazing. The, again, the resolution and the distinctions that you've been able to make between these different mental states using uh, that hardware. And, um, you know, what we were talking about before is uh, just to even complicate the picture even more, it, it's almost like uh, you've got the lovely clinical equipment that you can bring people into the clinic or use at conferences or workshops and do all the really uh, intricate stuff. But then on the other hand, you have these devices coming out like Muse, Emotive, these other consumer devices that maybe don't have the same sort of resolution of the equipment that you're using, but at the same time expose people to 
neurofeedback technology in their own homes makes it easier for them to use and maybe gets them excited to, to come and use the, the more complicated equipment too. But I was curious, and you've done work with uh, Muse through Story Up, and I want to get yep. to talking about that here in a little bit. But I, I want first, I wanted to get your overall take and um, you know what place mobile EEG technology has in in this whole niche that we're talking about. Yeah, you know, I mean, that is an interesting question, and to be honest, I've changed my tune over the last year and a half on that. Uh, initially, I was not impressed mm -hmm. just to be honest um, yeah. I was kind of like eh I don't know uh, you know yeah it's cute I don't know uh, you know um, and uh, to be honest I've changed my I've changed my story on this and, and the reason I've changed my story is because working with story up virtual reality company and this idea of kind of integrating uh, some of these wearables with virtual reality mm -hmm. um, you know we were kind of faced with well what what can we use what's available? And, you know, it's like, well, okay, you know, you, okay, Jeff, you can't have what you want, right? You know, so it's like, so, so what can we do with this? And as I've been working with it, I've been more and more impressed that it's like, you know, as a piece of hardware, it works just fine. It, it absolutely measures your brain waves accurately. Um, we've even validated that in some of our stuff, you know, where we've got the, the headband on with an EEG cap with 19 electrodes to say, okay, is it doing what we think it's doing? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it is. Um, and, you know, and we've found some clever ways to um, recreate some of these neuromeditation styles with a simplified headband. Is it as good? No, probably not, because it's not as precise. Um, does it get the job done? Yeah, it does. You know, is it enough to give you information about your internal state so that you can start to shift and learn from it? Absolutely. And so... Um, you know, so now I'm, you know, much more excited about it. And, um, in fact, putting more of my energy into that area of like, okay, you know, th yeah, that's great. We've got this big, fancy, complicated stuff that most people aren't going to have access to. Um, so what can we do with what we have and, and with what's already out there? And, um, and yeah, like I said, I'm pretty pleased actually with how it's going. And, you know, when you hear people and you know this, you know, cause you've been, you've been working with the wearables more than I have. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you can do a lot, there's a lot you can do. And so, and I'm excited for where it's going, uh, you know, to, to see how this evolves, um, where we do have more simplified kinds of things that are easier to use, lower price point, uh, you know, virtual reality headgear where the EEG sensors are baked right into the headset. You don't have to have two pieces of equipment, you know, all that kind of fun thing. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about the Story Up app that you've been working on. I know it has something to do with evoking empathy and uh, it responding to that, but could you be a little bit more, uh, tell us a little bit more? Yeah, so I've been working with a company called Story Up. They're based in Columbia, Missouri, which um, is where I spent most of my adult life. Uh, I just moved to Oregon a couple of years ago. And um, one of their, well, th their main product now, it's called Helium. Uh, H E A L, very clever, mm -hmm. and um, and essentially what we have it's been evolving that that program has been evolving, but basically what it has turned into is the four neural meditation styles in virtual reality. So there's experiences for open heart, there's experiences for quiet mind, uh, for mindfulness. Um, so you you know you go to the menu, you can select the different things. Um, and so you can just use it as a standalone little five minute VR meditation. Um, now that the quest is out, we're going to start making uh, longer meditations. We were limited by the um, Oculus Go, um, you know, really kind of being stuck at about seven or eight minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're going to start making things that are 10, 15 minutes long uh, for people who want a little bit of a longer uh, engagement. Um, but, you know, the, the, the thing that's kind of stood out for us is the ability to integrate the Muse headband with that so that uh, you can actually see um, some a reflection of your brainwave pattern and use that to drive the experience. And so right now we have two protocols that are available. We've got another one that's almost ready. So we have one for the open heart and then we have one for quiet mind that are already available. And then the focus will be the next one that comes out and that should be out 
I'd say within the next month. And so then what you can kind of do is pick the experience and then pick which style you're trying to do. Uh, and, you know, and get that immediate feedback and, you know, make it easier or make it harder. Um, you know, that so is kind so of exciting. Next- and like, I think what's different about it too, is it's eyes open meditation, right? With the VR. So you kind of have to practice, like practice these meditations in your waking life, which I think is something that people are going to need more and more in our crazy scattered world where you can't just sit down and close your eyes all the time, you know? <clears throat> yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I, um, that was another one of those things I had to wrestle with at the beginning, you know, just my sort of bias of my meditation training, which was all eyes closed. Um, and really kind of coming to terms with the idea that, you know, we're talking about how you're using your attention. Uh, and that's the critical thing. Do you have to sit on a cushion with your eyes closed? No. You know, we're talking about how you're engaging your attention. You can do that a lot of ways. You can do it while you're doing Qigong. You can do it while you're doing yoga. You can do it with a VR headset on. You know, there's, it's really about your ability to direct your attention and have flexibility in negotiating your states of consciousness. I, personally, that's what I think. And so this is sort of like a power tool, you know, uh, to facilitate that. That's, I'm so excited to dive into it even more. I wanted to hear more about your uh, uh, neuro meditation online course as well. Um, what can people expect by, you know, engaging you in that type of course and going through that training? Yeah, the online course right now, uh, there's actually a bunch of courses on there. Um, but um, so we have little mini courses like identified for each of the four styles. So somebody's just interested in focus or they're just interested in mindfulness. And then we have kind of the master course that has everything, um, you know, and some. I think it's like 58 lessons or something crazy. I mean, it's it's nuts. Um, and so these courses are not specifically designed for EEG neurofeedback applications. That, that, that will be coming. Um, this is a little bit more of that other thing that I was talking about of like the concepts the science, what's going on, and then a variety of strategies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we, we, we talk and teach about various strategies and, you know, there's downloadable meditations and stuff like that for each one. You know, the idea is, the whole idea with the whole program is like, can we help people find, A, what kind of meditation is going to be best suited for what they're interested in, and then secondarily, some tools that resonate for them to help them get there. And recognizing that everybody's different. And so having a one size fits all program is not going to make sense. Um, that's kind of our gig is that it's like, okay, yeah, it's a little messy because, because it's not, a, it's not like, here's our program. Here's the four things. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, you know, the four things for Cody is going to be different than the four things for me. Cause we're different people. And so, you know, you can't really do it that way. Uh, that, I mean, that's our approach, you know, is, is trying to really individualize it. Yeah. Very, uh, personalized, very customized. Sounds very nice. Um, well, I really appreciate you coming on the program. I wanted to ask you, you know, we talked a lot about, uh, the past and where this has all come from and what, where, where do you think this is going? Where do, where do you think mobile EEG or even other brain imaging technologies could come in and help us all develop our brains to, to the next level? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And, and that actually might be the hardest one. You know, I mean, you would, you would, you would think I'd have a, a strong opinion maybe based on kind of what I do, but there's so many things happening so fast right now. I feel like I, I can't keep up. Um, you know, every time I get on my computer, you know, I've got five new things in my inbox from people sending me stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, so I, I don't know what's going to stick and what's not going to stick, but I know that there are technologies being developed to monitor multiple aspects of physiology from something like your watch. You know, like the technology is getting very slick and, you know, it's going to be a few years, I think, but I think it's, I think it's inevitable that we're all going to be walking around with monitors on us in a very non-intrusive way. You know, it's going to be a ring and it's going to be a watch and, you know, an earpiece And, you know, we're going to be able to monitor all, you know, your blood pressure and your heart rate variability and your respiration and uh, your brain waves. And 
you know, you, when you start combining all of that, the different algorithms that, that are possible to learn how to, to sort of navigate your internal state, I mean, it's like, it, it's kind of mind blowing. And, and I think that's where we're going. It's going to be a few years, but, uh, you know, maybe five years. Uh, but I mean, it, it seems very clear that's where we're heading. And, you know, you go to some of these conferences or you talk to some of these people who are in these tech companies and it, it's being worked on. It's not like this is sort of like I'm making stuff up. Like this is out there. It's just not in the consumer market yet. Yep. And we'll be here to track it and use it as any way that we can to help people. <laughs> and it's amazing that the end product is just uh, enhancing these practices that have been around for so long and, um, you know, having people really sharpen up their minds to the best of their abilities so they can just, you know, be the most effective and peaceful and thriving as they can. So I, I really appreciate you coming on the program and I can't wait to see uh, what comes out of Neuro Meditation Institute and Story Up. Thanks. Hey, and I, you know, I really appreciate the work you're doing. It's, uh, you know, thanks for, you know, creating all these videos and sharing this, this information. I think it's really helpful for everybody. It's my pleasure. It's the more people know about it, the more information we'll have, right? Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.